Hello and welcome back to our Sunday Gospel Reflection and with the Institute of Catholic Culture. We're here for our 10th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Let's begin with the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, we, we continue on our uh, theme of, uh, as we began with Pascha, with Easter, uh, Pentecost, and the Sundays following Pentecost, and, and now really the church places before us a beautiful image uh, recalling us to our proper home, a realization of why Christ came, the purpose of his coming, the purpose of the giving of the Holy Spirit, uh, which is ultimately the restoration of the kingdom of God on earth, the restoration of paradise. We jump right in then to Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, verse 9 through 15. Father Sebastian, do you have your Bible with you today? Everyone's got their Bible? Very good. Okay, there we go. All right, Genesis chapter 3, verse 9 through 15. It's a text that we're very familiar with, we've heard many times, which is always a challenge for us. We want to be able to encounter the, uh, the biblical texts that are given to us each Sunday kind of fresh and new, which is the purpose of our Sunday Gospel Reflection, to kind of stop have a chance to consider the text, and then, um, and then uh, attend the liturgy more profitably. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. After the man, Adam, had eaten of the tree, the Lord God called to the man and asked him, Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Then he asked, Who told you that you were naked? You have eaten then from the tree of which I had forbidden you to eat. The man replied, The woman whom you put here with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and so I ate it. The Lord God then asked the woman, Why did you do such a thing? And the woman answered, The serpent tricked me into it, so I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because, I have, because you have done this, you shall be banned from all the animals, and from all the wild creatures on your belly shall you crawl, and dirt shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head, while you shall strike at his heel. And certainly, Father Sebastian is a uh, is a change uh, or apparent change from what we've been looking at as we've been confronting the New Testament texts. Uh, and then the text, uh, even from the Old Testament, specifically about Pentecost. Um, we've been on this theme even through uh, the Feast of Corpus Christi, uh, talking about the gift of the Eucharist, which is, which is uh, given to us for our journey back toward paradise. But now the church place before us paradise itself. But in terms of the fall, uh, at least in the first line, after the man Adam had eaten of the tree, so we have here the text of the fall, but then at the very last verse uh, that were, is given to us, also a, uh, what is traditionally called the Proto-Evangelium, the first good news. Uh, so both the problem and a promise of the restoration. Um, it's, talk with us a little bit about uh, the context of this passage um, and its importance for us today. Sure, the context here is very important to understand the gravity of this passage. The context, of course, is the story of the Garden of Eden. God put man in the garden to dwell there for all eternity. This is the beginning of the kingdom of God. This is the beginning of the church. This is the place where God and man dwell together. But we hear that man was tested here, tempted by the devil, by this serpent, and he turned away from God. He turned away from the word of God. God had given him his word, and he was to obey that word, but he chose to turn away from that. And what did he find as we read the story here? He found only death. As we continue on beyond this lectionary passage, we're going to hear that they are cast out of Eden. But that's not the end of the story. We know as we read this story and as we heard in the lectionary that there is hope. There is someone who is going to come, who is going to bruise the head of that serpent. And that looks forward to our New Testament reading today. 
you know, as you as you're kind of focusing our attention toward that New Testament reading, towards the work of Christ, I'm reminded, you know, having just celebrated Corpus Christi, that uh, that the fathers oftentimes interpret the cross of Christ as uh, as a tree, as Saint Paul talks about, as a tree, and uh, and and then Jesus is going to feed us with the new gift of His life, and so. Uh, obviously, we're, we're, we're staying here in the, in the context, the greater context of the gift of Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit, and as you're talking about, the restoration of that original plan, God's kingdom now reestablished on earth, and, and which, which brings us to our responsorial psalm, Psalm 130, and I encourage you to turn there um, and really read the entire psalm, uh, because there's this beautiful theme now given to us in uh, is Psalm 130, and that, that kind of gives, uh, centers our attention on the whole of the theme, which is the focus of this Sunday, and that is God's mercy um, and the fullness of redemption. And I just, I think we do well to, when we hear these words of mercy, forgiveness, redemption, to constantly have a, another word in our mind, and that is return. Return to, as you said, God's original plan. For what we read in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, of God's original plan doesn't change. The Lord doesn't change. We change. Um, you know, I, I've got to interrupt you here because this is one of the Psalms of Ascent. This Psalm is so relevant for what you're talking about. As you know, as we know, this is one of the Psalms of Ascent. So maybe you could talk to our listeners a little bit about your well, experience and our experience with those Psalms and how this ties into exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I don't want to go too far afield, but you know, the Psalms of Ascent are, are, uh, are some of the Psalms which the Old Testament church, the people of God in the Old Testament, prayed as they went up to Jerusalem. And so many of us here at the Institute, you, the two of us and, uh, and so many of our Institute friends have made that Ascent singing these psalms of ascent, uh, remembering God's mercy, because the, uh, the, the, uh, the people of the Old Testament saw Jerusalem very much in terms of restoration to paradise. Uh, God's home is again established there. Man is called into that home to come to communion with him. Um, so I'm glad you bring up this, this theme, because it's, it's this repetition of the theme that is now going to, to call us to the ascent to the mountain of God and entrance into his new temple, which is uh, the word of God himself, Jesus Christ. Um, and I think it's a beautiful, a beautiful theme that from Genesis chapter three, all the way through the Old Testament, and even to today, we look toward the, the, the dwelling place of God with this constant repetition as we, as we hear in Psalm 130 of God's mercy his redemption, uh, and as I said, ultimately his return, uh, or our return to his original plan. Um, in Psalm 130, uh, starting at verse 1, with the Lord there is mercy and, f and the fullness of redemption. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attempted to my voice of supplication. With the Lord there is mercy and the fullness of redemption. With the Lord, there is mercy and the fullness of redemption. With the Lord, there is mercy and the fullness of redemption. And I, I repeat those 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 uh, those words because they're meant to be this um, this constant uh, repetition in our liturgy to give us a sense of the theme uh, that we're that we're looking at today. As we've received the gift of the Holy Spirit, we receive the fullness of the forgiveness of our sins. You know, I, I oftentimes ask, well, what happened when you were baptized? And the ultimate answer is we received God's life within us. What happens when you receive the Eucharist? We receive God's life within us. What happens when you go to confession? We receive God's life within us. You know, these ideas of redemption, of salvation, of mercy, are all tied to this one beautiful idea of the restoration of God's original plan, which is his dwelling among his people and the filling up of our life with his life, 
Um, and, and, and this is the great mystery which we've encountered at Pentecost. And it's the great mystery which the church continually brings us to. We have entered back into God's original plan. We've entered back into his kingdom. And we shouldn't expect the picture to look all that different. He's going to feed us once again with the gift of his life. But there's going to be a battle. And that battle is, uh, is over uh, man. We are in some, I, I like to say, we are the battlefield between God and the evil one. And he has reclaimed us for himself. But of course, the devil's not done with his attack. We received the gift of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. The church has been given her mission. The restoration of the kingdom of God has happened. And yet the battle is still there very much taking place in the heart of man. Um, and, uh, and, and, and this comes full force here in Mark chapter 3. So let's take a look at our gospel text, Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Um, one of my favorite passages uh, that, again, we read, uh, we look at when we're in Galilee um, and doing our Bible studies there. Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus came home with his disciples. And of course, the home is uh, um, uh, Capernaum, right? It is the place where he loved to be, uh, just north of the place where he called the apostles. Uh, Jesus came home with his disciples. Again, the crowd gathered, making it impossible for them even to eat. When his relatives heard of this, they set out to seize him, for they said he's out of his mind. The scribes who had come from Jerusalem said he's possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons, he drives out demons. Of course, just before this, he had been in the synagogue in Capernaum and had driven out the demons. You have to go back and read the context here of Mark chapter 3. Summoning them, he began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. That is the end of him. But no one can enter a strong man's house to plunder his property unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder the house. Amen. I say to you, all sins and all blasphemies that people utter will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, but, in, but, but is guilty of an everlasting sin. For they had said he has an unclean spirit. His mother and his brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd seated around him told him, Your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside asking for you. But he said to them in reply, Who is my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those seated in a circle, he said, Here are my brother. Here are, here's my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is a long reading, Father Sebastian, with a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot to say about this text and a lot of challenging uh, words here. But the, I think the first thing, just from a, from a make sure that we're all on the same page, who's Beelzebub? <laughs> you know, we've been hearing this, this title, uh, I mean, obviously pointing certainly to the evil one, but it's a strange name. What did it, what does it mean, Beelzebub? So we hear Beelzebub or Beelzebul, different translations. It has to do with manuscripts and, and the Aramaic. But in the end, basically, this is a name that goes back to uh, one of the Philistine gods. Uh, the, uh, remember, the Philistines were the, one of the major competitors for the region geographically back in the Old Testament period, especially in the time of David and before him. And so, uh, so the gods of the Philistines were understood by the Israelites to be demonic personalities. The gods of Egypt were understood by the Israelites to be demonic personalities. And they were. St. Paul says this in his letter to Corinthians in chapter 10. He says the Corinthian or the, uh, the, um, the pagans, when they wor what they worship, they're, they're not gods that they worship. They worship demons. So these are demonic personalities behind these these pagan deities, these characters, 
And then what the Jews would do is they would identify the main god of a pantheon, a pagan pantheon, say Zeus or Beelzebub or Baal, etc. They would identify that as Satan. He's the main leader of the demons of those pagan gods of that particular people. And they saw all of these pagan religions around them as just simply, as they were, a demonic trick to draw them away from the true king and the true kingdom of God on earth. And so that's what we hear here. The, uh, the Jews are referring to Satan in, uh, with a, the name of a local pagan deity here. He casts out demons by the prince of demons. And this is obviously a reference to Satan as we continue to read on. Jesus even refers to the word. He says, how can, how can I cast out Satan by the power of Satan? That doesn't make any sense. So that's, that's what's behind this. And then we jump right into this, the second aspect of this, uh, uh, right there and in, in leading from this thing about Satan versus Satan, is the sin against the Holy Spirit those who blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. And, and I think obviously as we keep our focus on what the church wants us to focus on, and that is Pentecost, um, that, uh, that, that now there's this challenge of, that, is, that is given to us um, about, uh, from, the, from the mouth of Christ himself. Um, those who blaspheme against the Holy Spirit will never, uh, will never have forgiveness, but is guilty of everlasting sin. Well, what's Jesus talking about here? A blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not something necessarily easy to understand. And certainly, it almost, I've had conversations with people about this before. It's almost this, the magical sin. It's the unforgivable sin. Uh, what is this sin and why is it so bad and, and why is it everlasting? And I think a lot of people, probably myself included, look back and say, well, geez, I've lived ways that are certainly uh, against the work of God, um, am I guilty of a sin which cannot be forgiven? Is there anything that, that is beyond God's power to forgive? Well, as you pointed out, this is one of your uh, most favorite stories here. And, it, and, uh, and as you know, and, and I think most of our listeners know, especially if they were on that pilgrimage with us when we covered this section, uh, the, uh, the, the greater context here is this theme of forgiveness of sin. We hear this idea of whose sins will be forgiven. But that recalls for us, it's a framing device back to the story of Jesus healing the paralytic man in the house there, Peter, back earlier in the story. This is in chapter 2. Mm -hmm. so we have to kind of go back there for the context a bit. In chapter 2, it says uh, in verse uh, well, verse 1 and following, there he's in Peter's house, and, uh, and they... There's no room to get this paralytic man in, so they tear open the roof and they drop him down. We all know the story. It's very dramatic. And then Jesus says something that's kind of shocking for the, the people there in verse 5. This is chapter 2, verse 5. He says, he says, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning their hearts. They said, why does this man speak thus? It is blasphemy. So there's, there's, this, there's that framing device. We hear the theme of forgiveness of sin. We hear about blasphemy. For who can forgive sins but God alone? And then, of course, Jesus shows them that he has the authority to do such a thing by raising the man from the dead, or from his paralysis. And then it says in verse 10, uh, well, verse 11, I say to you, rise, take up your pallet, and go home. In verse 15, he rose and immediately took up the pallet and went home. So they were all amazed and glorified God, saying we, have never, saw, we never saw anything like this. So here, what's going on in the Gospels, we find is the ideal situation is that when Jesus preaches, someone hears what he says, they accept his word, and they follow him. But we find that's not really what typically happens. Some may do that, but many question his word. They're not able to grasp what he's saying. They're not able to accept it. And so out of mercy, as in the present case, even though they've insulted him, they've accused him of committing blasphemy. So this is a sin against the Son of Man. This is a, a sin against Jesus. But 
they now are able to come to forgiveness of that. They're able to repent of that because they have a change of heart. They see from his work that his words were true. But then we come to another problem, and that is, what about the rest of the crowd? There's those who accepted Jesus' words and followed him. There are those, the second group, who did not accept his words, but then see his works and realize that those works must be by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, therefore, they accept his words. But what if you're in neither of those first two groups? What if you conclude, as we come to now the story that we're looking at here, that what he is doing, his works, are by the power of Satan? then what you've just done is you've identified the Holy Spirit as Satan. You're accusing the Holy Spirit now of being Satan. And it's not like the Holy Spirit is just a very difficult guy to get along with. I, as you pointed out, I remember as a kid hearing this, sitting in church and hearing this and thinking, wow, you just don't want to mess with that Holy Spirit. He is a very, very unforgiving individual. But that's not what's going on here in the story. We've heard of those who have blasphemed Jesus. They've insulted Jesus. They've accused him of sin and blasphemy against God. But then they come to repentance by looking at his works, which are by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they can come to forgiveness. But if you conclude that his very works, which are by the Holy Spirit, are rather by the power of Satan or Beelzebub, and you've identified now the Holy Spirit as Satan, then you've committed a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And what that means is not that the Holy Spirit's unforgiving. It's just that there's no plan C. That's it. I mean, you, you had to see his works and conclude that those works are by the power of the Holy Spirit, and therefore his words are true, and therefore follow him. But if you conclude that those works are by the power of the Holy Spirit, then how can you have any forgiveness? So by rejecting the very the very source of forgiveness it's uh, you know i oftentimes think in this we we look in juridical terms at this passage but ultimately we need to look in in relational terms and if i reject the possibility of god's work in my life he's not going to force it on me so if i reject the gift of the holy spirit the healing power of god and i put that at a distance uh, he will never force that on me and therefore i make it impossible for God to work in my life, uh, or at least I put up a barrier for my restoration. And again, you know, I, I want to bring us back to this whole theme that is given to us now, mercy, but in terms of restoration, God's gift of his Holy Spirit in terms of restoring us to his kingdom and his dominion, rather than the dominion of the evil one un, into, into whose kingdom, in a sense, our first parents walked now jesus has come to restore us to the kingdom of god um and and that kingdom of god is a relational kingdom uh which is why it's so beautiful that that the passage here concludes with this question of who the who who's in relationship with god who is the mother of jesus and who are his brethren and uh and i think sometimes people look at this passage and say it seems that jesus is putting down his mother and saying, no, I reject my brothers. I reject everyone. I reject, you know, all of this, but, but it's not the case, is it? Um, in fact, it's, it's um, the last, the last verse here of what Jesus says that, that those, my, my mother and my brother are those who do the will of God. Um, and uh, I, in fact, I think it's in another passage says those who hear the word and do it. And who is the one who is, heard the word of God and has done it is Mary. So, which is so beautiful because we have an opportunity now to be counted as his brothers, his sisters, his, his, his relations that are going to share his life with him. If we, as you said a minute ago, we hear his word and we do something about it. Uh, Mary's place, her role in the church um, her glorification is not simply that she gave birth to Jesus, but that she heard the word of God, the announcement that she was to be the mother of God, and accepted that gift of his work in her life. 
And in the broader passage here, those who blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, those who, who say it's not possible. It's not possible for this, this gift to be present in my life. The restoration itself is not possible, but in fact, it is possible. And it has happened. And the kingdom of God has been restored. And you and I are now brought into, invited into the restoration of that kingdom, which is the church, the Garden of Eden restored. With all of that background, then, let's jump into the, the epistle that is appointed today, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse... 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. Brothers and sisters, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We too believe, and therefore we speak, knowing that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and place us with you in his presence. Everything indeed is for you, so that the grace bestowed in abundance on more and more people may cause the thanksgiving to overflow for the glory of God. Therefore, we are not discouraged. Rather, although our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to what is seen but to what is unseen for what is seen is transitory but what is unseen is eternal for we know that if our earthly dwelling a tent should be destroyed we have a building from god a dwelling not made with hands eternal in heaven how beautiful this passage is in the context of Genesis chapter 3 and the broader context of Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. We have uh, here the, the theme of resurrection, of restoration, as we, as we talked about even in the, in the psalm verses that are chanted. Um, and this idea of, uh, of heaven and a dwelling that is waiting for us. Father Sebastian, how would the early Christians hearing, receiving this letter from St. Paul in Corinth have understood this text? I, I find myself trying to import all sorts of, of, uh, of say, just my own life, my own modern application and so forth, but we got to get into its original context. Why is St. Paul talking about this in 2 Corinthians? So the Corinthians, as we've talked about in other places, uh, were, were plagued by some problems. One of them, most importantly, was this, this pagan idea that the material world was evil, that our bodies were evil or irrelevant. And they struggled with the idea of bodily resurrection. The, as <clears throat> we've talked about so many times, it's so important to grasp that. As we've talked about in earlier uh, studies, we covered uh, the the theme of the resurrection earlier in Pentecost. Bodily resurrection is the good news. We say it every Sunday in our creed. We believe in one baptism. We believe in the resurrection of the dead and the world to come. And But while we say that, we often ourselves almost are like the Corinthians who kind of disregard that or, or forget about it. But that's what this is all about. God created man who is both material and immaterial, spirit and body, soul, body and soul. And that relationship is in a relationship of our, of our existence that we cannot deny and we can't not reject. This is who we are, how God made us. And so we are reminded, of course, of the original problem that we began with today, that man is going to face death as a result of having moved out of the presence of God, have rejected the word of God. They're out of relationship with him. And as a result, they find death. But Christ has come to restore all those things, as we heard. He came to restore man to a relationship with the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit through acceptance of the word, who is Jesus Christ, right? So 
the, this, in, the, in the Corinthian community, Paul had trouble preaching to them the fullness of the gospel because they, and he did preach it to them, but he had to preach it over and over and write letters about it because they had a lot of trouble with this idea that they were going to be raised from the dead. They even doubted whether Jesus had been bodily raised. They didn't like that idea. And he dealt with that in the first epistle, proved to them that there were witnesses. And then he had to prove to them, therefore, that they are going to be raised from the dead in Christ someday when he returns. But then the question arises, well, what will our bodies be like? And so Paul talks about the present situation of our, in our bodies that we're in as Christians. Our, our bodies are not exactly what we're going to see at the end. Our bodies, when we are raised from the dead, will be a renewed body, a, an Edenic body, an immortal body, recreated by God, refashioned like from the beginning in the image of his son, so that we too may share in that resurrection and, and bodily, bodily existence in eternity. That's a, you know, I think you're right that a lot of times we, we have a, a misconceived notion of what heaven looks like. Um, we, we get kind of uh, oftentimes this idea of floating around in the clouds uh, that uh, for all eternity, rather boring. <laughs> so, but, uh, but, but Jesus gives us, and St. Paul here gives us a, a, a different uh, uh, perception, and certainly St. John in the book of Revelation gives us a different concept, and that is a concept of restoration. And that restoration has already begun, um, just as the common things of this world, bread and water and wine and so forth, are transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and given a new nature, divinized, if you will, and made uh, partakers of the divine nature so that they themselves can communicate that divine life. So too with us, or we can say even more so with us, our restoration is certainly a bodily restoration. We're made this way by God, not for decay and death, but for life and restoration. Um, and, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at this, at the, the text which are given to us today, um, is so beautiful in the light of Pentecost, in the light of all of these great mysteries, which we have celebrated and now continue to celebrate the church inviting us today, not to blaspheme the work of the Holy Spirit, but to accept the reality of what has taken place in our baptism which is the beginning of our restoration to glory. And in this epistle that is given to us, the, there's a passage which is, jumps out at me, um, where St. Paul says that, that since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke, we too believe and therefore we speak. Uh, and, and maybe we can, we can leave this here because now in the, in the, in the light of Pentecost, still living in the, the shining light of Pentecost, if you will, and the realization of what has taken place in our life and the call to the restoration of the entire created order in the image and likeness of God. We no longer, no longer use our mouths as Adam and Eve did to blame others, to point the finger, but rather to take responsibility for where we stand but then to allow our bodies to be used for the glory of God. As the apostles, as St. Paul did, I believe and therefore I cannot remain silent about what has taken place in my life. I believe and therefore I must speak and share the gift of God's glory with others as the apostles did. You know, they converted the whole world in a short amount of time, virtually the whole world in 300 years what had formerly been a world separated from God was restored to the kingdom um, with the conversion of the, of the entire empire. Um, do we think anything less is going to happen in our life if we do not blaspheme the work of the Holy Spirit, but rather invite him into our life to begin that work of restoration, to allow him to speak through us, to work through us, that we dedicate our lives, as you mentioned over the last few weeks, to bring our whole life to the work of Jesus Christ. 
our hands, our feet, our homes, our, our cars, our uh, cell phone, everything, to lay it at the feet of the Lord and say, I know it is a gift from you, Lord. Now use these things for the restoration of your kingdom. Use me for the restoration of your kingdom. I will pray for all of you, as I'm, I'm sure Father Sebastian also will, for all of you here participating in our Sunday Gospel Reflections, that these are not simply words kept at the outside that we learn about, that we listen to, but they become a reality in our life, uh, this gift of the Holy Spirit, that through all of us, the restoration of God's creation may be wrought. To him be glory both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen.